Okay. Did you hit the record button? Yes, I did. It's been recording since we got on. Okay, we are live. Yep. Okay, hello everybody. How are you doing today? I hope you guys are having a fantastic week so far. Today we are joined with um, Bishop James Long. We're going to talk about demonology today. He has a presentation to share with everyone. But real quick, I want to introduce him. He is an exorcist and he's a bishop for the United States Old Catholic Church. He's made several appearances and interviews, including you've probably seen him on the History Channel, Travel Channel, or Sci-Fi Channel. And he's done, he has appeared on Ghost Adventures, Bobby Mackey's episodes. So before we get started, um, Bishop Long, could you just let us know what got you into this field and why you do what you do? And then it's all yours to carry on the presentation. Well, what really got me into the field is uh, the calling. Uh, I, I knew that I wanted to be a priest when I was five years old. And there was no question that I, that's what I wanted. Um, and that desire to become a priest never has never stopped. It just continued to grow. And then, of course, uh, I remember picking up my first book on demonology when I was nine. And I didn't know why. I just knew that, that I had to, to learn as much as I could. It was, it was a huge, I was drawn to it. I was just absolutely drawn to it. And I couldn't, I couldn't couldn't go away from it. I had to get as much as I could. And I've studied ever since. I've, I haven't stopped studying. I study even today. I find books that are reputable. And I even study from, you know, from different perspectives as well. Uh, I joined the, uh, of course, I was Roman Catholic all my life. And uh, I joined the Roman Catholic seminary. So I studied for the priesthood uh, for six years, but decided uh, because I, I, strongly support the LGBTQ community, I, women ordination, and I want to be able to administer to anyone. I don't care who you are. I don't care what faith you are. I don't care uh, what sexual orientation or gender or, or, or even your religious stat. I want to be able to minister to everyone. So for me, that's why I joined the Old Catholic Church, where the United States Old Catholic Church, we are allowed to get married if we want. We can be married to the same sex, to the partner if we want. Um, we officiate gay weddings. We are just an inclusive church community. We just, it, it's simple. It's very, it, it's not complicated. It's the way it should be. And so, but I was uh, mentored by an exorcist. Um, the uh, archbishop at the, at the time where I was studying the Roman church knew that I had a calling to serve uh, within the ministry of um, demonology. And so there were some long-term plans that were being prepared should I have stayed in, in, the, in the Roman church, but I decided not to. I've done, uh, performed 30 exorcisms. When I went public with my ministry, there was no Catholic clergy helping. It didn't exist. It did, it did not exist. The only person that existed was uh, Bishop McKenna, and he is old Catholic, but he's up uh, in, in the New England states, and he didn't want to take on any public cases. That was just something that he was not that was not his calling to do. So when I got involved and when, when I went public with my ministry over 20 years ago, the only person that was doing it was Father Andrew Calder. And he didn't want to perform exorcisms. Now he'll do deliverances, but he had no desire or calling to perform exorcisms. So when I went public with my ministry, I was the only Catholic clergy going public who were will, who was willing to help um, the paranormal community. And it was a very interesting, <laughs> it's been a very interesting um, experience, some good, some not so good. And so I'll, I'll be happy to explain all of that, you know, in the presentation. So that's just basically the, the rundown of who I am. I have a, just a quick question. A lot of paranormal investigators, you know, get into it because they have some experience as a, as a child. Did you have anything happen to you early on? Okay. Or you knew you wanted to be a priest, but was there some other situation that happened that was paranormal that that made you think okay something's going on out there and an incredible yeah that's a great question it absolutely i did even one that i i um i i have sometimes even today it's just it's, it is a dream that i have uh i dreamt when i was a kid um i was in of course my, my parents home and they had marble floors in the basement and that's where my that's where my room was and so I remember waking up in the middle of the night and this was in my dream and I looked over on the dresser and there was this figure lying on a cot. And I thought, well, what, what's, what's this? So I got up out of bed and I walked over to this figure and it looked like to me, like Christ, 
I mean, but his his the face and the skin was very dark grayish uh, colorish like a shark's color like a like a like a great white uh, color it was grayish um he had the crown of thorns on he had gold sandals he had the alb the white alb he was bleeding from his hands he was bleeding from his face and my first instinct was to reach down and touch his hand which i did and i, I touched his hand and he opened his eyes and they were solid red solid mm -hmm. red and he, he he stood up and he looked at me and he said, what the hell are you looking at? Oh. And so immediately I knew, okay, I wasn't dealing with something that I thought I was. So I grabbed the, my, my first communion crucifix from my wall and I held it up to him. And he just looked at me and did with one hand, he just kind of crushed the cross and just, he was laughing. And, but as he was laughing, his hand started to bleed and the cross turned into like black ash. And the, his exact words to me, were and i'll never forget it um is that supposed to hurt me i died on the stupid ass thing i mean it, it, it was just very cold very callous i mean it was very that was my first introduction to predatorial i think a predatorial being and so i went upstairs and we called the priest the priest came down and he performed the exorcism and uh he was going through the ritual and this entity started screaming in pain and he reached out his hands I, I then saw his uh, true identity. He had claws, it, it, it was fingernails, but there was sympathy. I, there was sympathy to this thing because I, he was, he was suffering. And so he was, he reached his hand out to me at, 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 like to help. And so I reached my hand out at, at, as a form of empathy. Like I, 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 I didn't know what I wanted to do. I just didn't like this, like to see this thing in pain. And then that's when I woke up. And I could not breathe. Uh, I, I, I was having severe breathing problems. And I looked over and the crucifix, my first communion crucifix had actually been thrown across the room. Uh, and I looked over to my right and about 15 feet away from my bed, that, that figure was actually there. Now I was no longer dreaming. I was completely awake. I was conscious, completely awake. And I saw the figure standing right there in full form. And he just sort of disappeared away. And his, his, his face was bleeding. And the next day I, I told my mom about, it. she was very angry because she went downstairs and she, she, there's blood stains on the floor, these red stains on the floor. And so they try to scrub and my mom was in the medical field. So she knew how to scrub floor. She knew how to clean, um, you know, from, from blood droppings, et cetera, cause she was in the medical field. She was trained in it. They couldn't get it. They couldn't get the red stains off and they tried and there were red stains everywhere. And they thought that I did some paint or something. So they had a professional come down and said, it's not paint. Uh, you'd have to completely take this whole entire thing apart and put brand new marble down because it, we can't, we can't get it off. So they eventually, it was just cheaper to put carpet. So now even today, those red stains are still there in that house. And now there's carpet there. Okay. That gave me cold chills. <laughs> I don't know about anybody else. Yeah, and I've had that dream several times. Uh, but that was the first time I'll never, never forget the first, never, ever will I forget the first time. But the same experience of seeing that demonic, I have come across that demonic during an exorcism. I, that, I've, I that have come across that experience. I'm sorry? That, that particular one you saw, you've encountered it or... I, well, he didn't give me its name. Um, and so I, I don't know the identity of it, but I, I would, I should say, the, the eyes were black or the eyes were solid red when, when the Jesus would look at me and you can't, he had that transition of blackness. And when he was crushing the cross, the, that eyes were started to turn just black, but it was, it was the same blackness that I became aware of on my first exorcism. Mm -hmm. And that is, a, that, that is a, uh, an experience I'll never forget. Never. It was a very hard lesson, but that was definitely a lesson for, for you to, to learn and grow and help others. I, 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 that's what I get out of it, that that was like, this is your challenge. This is your mission now. <laughs> but um, if you want to go ahead and start your presentation, because I could already start asking you a million questions. And I know. Well, <laughs> well, and, and, well, we can do it either way. We can do the presentation. You can jump in and, and, and this is y'all's thing and however you want y'all so you can see i'm from kentucky y'all <laughs> um, uh, by god but uh, <laughs> so anyway just jump in anytime you want i mean if okay. you have a question or you don't understand or hey look what about this or what about that you know that's that's great because i because a lot of times you'll say something and it'll open up a rabbit hole where 10 things will come to my mind and i'll 
Yeah. So, and probably people are thinking the same thing that you're thinking. So I, I'll just I'll just open a, a PowerPoint presentation. Uh, I'm like I don't really want to go through the whole PowerPoint because it's a, a little a little too educational, too I think classy. If you uh, classy <laughs> meaning too like uh, okay now we're in class everybody too take formal. notes yeah 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. So uh, but this is just some things that I, I some notes I put together that I think you guys might be interested in. So this is a little bit about me. This is um the the thirty exorcisms that I have performed. Um, they have been their documented exorcisms, which, and that's very important. Documented exorcisms means I've had a medical team there. I had licensed psychiatrists involved. Their medical doctor it was involved. So this is all well documented 30 exorcisms and on people who are validly possessed. So uh, people always ask, well, about, um, I guess, by education. Um, I don't know why, but people always, ask, I guess, for credibility, but I, I don't know. I have a doctorate in ministry, a master of divinity, a master of education, a master of business. I have a bachelor's of journalism and associate of philosophy. I went to Loyola University in Chicago, went to St. Mary of the Lake Graduate School in Mundelein, Illinois, which I absolutely loved. Graduated from Sullivan University, Argosy University. So these are accredited universities. Um, and it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work, but education is really, really important. It's always been important all my life and certainly to my family. Um, education. Why we started this group is for people who are, we kind of gear it toward people who are beginning in the paranormal field. We want them to get the basic fundamentals okay. of paranormal investigating and get on the right track and start out with good habits. One quick question. When you document an exorcism, mm -hmm. can you tell what all is included in documentation? What, what yeah. yeah, and and that's one of the most important things. Uh, and what here's what concerns me. I'll, I'll say this. When I went public with my ministry, I was the only person who was doing exorcisms because I was trained. I was trained in the right to do so. Uh, I'm deeply concerned now with people in the paranormal who are not trained in the right, who have no business even reading the right, mm -hmm. who are performing it. Mm -hmm. And let me tell you something. And, and I and I this is not, these are not my rules. Okay. The rules, the rubrics, the rules uh, is very clear. This is a very ancient ritual. This is not a, a ritual that was just, I mean, the first office, the mention of office of Exodus was in 264. So this is a very ancient rite. And the, the, the rubrics say that if you're not a validly ordained priest and you're given permission by your bishop to perform an exorcism, you have no business reading it. So, th but again, it's not my rules. And that is because that a person can do some serious damage to someone. So if someone comes to me and says, look, uh, Bishop Long, I, I think that I'm possessed. They're going to have to go through some, not hoops, but procedures, uh, because we want to make sure that where everything is done and done right and documented correctly. For example, if someone comes to you and they think that they're possessed. Okay, well, you need to have a psychological evaluation by a licensed psychiatrist. It's not, this is non-negotiable. I won't even go to your home without it. So if you say you're possessed, that's number one. Why? We have to rule out disassociative identity disorder, which is multiple personality. If you don't do that, then you can create another personality. And unfortunately, there are many people within the paranormal who are performing exorcisms on people and charging people. Number one, that's fraud. And number two, it's just absolutely completely immoral to the extreme levels. And more importantly, you could kill someone. But you could also create another personality within that individual who's suffering from multiple personalities. Or if a person is a paranoid schizophrenic, you could put them in a manic state. You can put them in a, in a really serious paranoid state and they can commit suicide. So this is something that you can't play around with. I'm not a licensed psychiatrist. And so I need to know for sure if this individual is dealing with any type of mental illness. That is crucial. I also have to know what type of medications they're on. Because many medications require sometimes you to hallucinate or hear things. The side effects of some medicines are terrible. So I need to know 100%. I need to know every type of medicine. I'm not trained in, in the medical field. So, But we have, met, we have folks who are trained. And I go to them and say, hey, look, this person is taking this medicine. They're taking this medicine. What are the side effects of this? And they'll let me know. Or sometimes I can talk to the doctor if they, if they, you know, if they uh, fill out forms of HIPAA laws. I have to have a form, no matter what, 
to, for the licensed psychiatrist to send me a form stating that performing an exorcism would not cause long-term emotional, psychological harm to their client. That's got to be done. Absolutely. Um, and so that has that process is 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 really absolutely essential. Can so, I ask you a question? Um, yeah. In this process, do you also require a physical exam to check for pops uh, like epilepsy or a brain tumor or any physiological problems along with psychological problems? Absolutely, because uh, many types of, uh, of catatonic states, for example, if a person doesn't blink, that could be a neurological condition. And immediately someone who's not trained in demonology would say, oh, that the person's possessed. No, the person could be suffering from epilepsy. Mm -hmm. or, or, or even narcolepsy. There, there are several issues that neurological conditions that could cause these side effects. So unless you're a neurologist, you have no, you have no business even saying, well, this person has this or that's diagnosis and it's illegal. And so you cannot make medical diagnosis on people without having uh, the proper credentials to do so. And so, yes, I make sure that these tests are done. And not only that, but we have to check their heart. We have to check we, uh, their, 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 um, pulse, we have to check their blood pressure. This is, these are all crucial because it, when you're performing an exorcism on someone, that's very dangerous. I have a medical team that's actually there with me and they're monitoring the vitals of the possessed because the person could expire. They could have a heart attack. They could have a stroke. And I, I am not trained in the medical field. I, I know the signs of a stroke, but that I have no, no legal justification or right to say, well, this person is having this because I have no credentials to say that. So I need people who are trained in the medical field to make those calls. And so we make sure that everything is done before we even consider that exorcism is the absolute last, absolute last resort when there, there, there are no, there's no other option. That is the only option that there is. Then you look into the exorcism. And, but again, that's, that's, that is the absolute last resort. Uh, and, and I don't remember, I've done this now for over 20 years public. And I have, uh, I have a very active ministry. And the reason I'm pulling this up, I don't know. There you go. I don't know if you, that's 3000. 99 emails in two days, <laughs> two that days. And that's two days. And, and, and all my spam has already been identified. So I, that's all been, that's, that's ministry, that's ministry email. So this is not spam because it's already been identified. So these are people from all over the world requesting help uh, mm -hmm. for, for a variety of reasons. But a majority of those are from people who think that they're either possessed or have demonic infestation. So I'm, I just showed you 3,099 emails in two days. And I've done 20, well, I, 30 exorcisms in 20 years. So that should give you an idea of how rare it is. Exactly. It is extremely rare, but it does occur. So yeah, um, are we good? Good. Okay. So um, I, I have written a book of Through the Eyes of an Exorcist, and I, I'm, I don't really push that. Um, you know, if people ever contacted me and said, hey, look, I'll make a donation to the ministry and just I'll send a PDF copy. I, I, I don't really care. Uh, I, I'm not really, I don't do this. I don't, I, I've never received payment for this. Never. So the Bobby Mackey's episodes, the Ghost Adventures, Exorcism Live on the Exorcist House. Um, the, uh, I, I was just recently at the American haunted American haunting, American haunting story. I think that's what it's called. Uh, there's a big, huge, the big house on American haunter. Is that, is that what it's called? American haunting story. I don't even watch America. it. American horror story, American horror story. There it yeah. is. American, American horror story. Uh, apparently it's the house in the first season. So I was there in October, uh, to do a live investigation there. But I don't charge anything because I never, I, I will never allow greed to enter. And I'm a human being just like anybody else. And because I'm in ministry, I suffer extreme, extreme oppression, extreme oppression as an exorcist. And so I have to have a zero tolerance level when it comes to money. I have to, so um, I, I have done uh, ministry all my life. I have a homeless ministry. It's still active. I go to homeless camps. I pass out food and clothes, sleeping bags to folks. And I also help young single moms who have left a very abusive relationship. 
And so, and people say, well, why don't they just go get apply for help? Well, they do, Einstein. But if you've ever applied for government assistance, you know you're not going to get government assistance that day. Yeah. And so they want to leave and get away from their boyfriend now. And so they need help making that transition. So I've been doing that for 15 years. So all, all of my ministry, the, the, the bishopjameslong.com, clicking on the, the paranormal course link that I have, all that stuff, any type of donation will go to the ministry. Okay, so um, we're going to talk a little bit about um, a human poltergeist and, and human spirits or demonic spirits. We're going to break this down. This actually is known as um, the Gates of Hell Cemetery in Kentucky. The Gates of Hell Cemetery, nobody knew the Gates of Hell Cemetery even existed. It existed because it was an abandoned cemetery. And my team found out about this about 18 years ago, that this old abandoned cemetery, no one even knew that it was there. And we were on a, um, an online radio show, brand new online radio show was the first of its kind. And my team was there. We were talking about the activity. We were talking about the place. And, the, and then people were saying, oh, this is a terrible place. I say, absolutely. This truly is the gates of hell. And from that moment on, this cemetery has been known from the Gates of Hell Cemetery because we've been we've done thousands of interviews talking about this cemetery, and it truly is the Gates of Hell Cemetery. This is one of the most violent places I have ever been to in my entire life. And uh, I, I would advise people not to Google it, not to look it up, and well, not to go visit. Um, really seriously, guys, this is one of the most honest to God the most violent places I've ever been to in my life. Is it from who's buried there or has no. something else come there? Yeah. A lot of satanic rituals are performed there and oh, a lot okay. of uh, animal, animal rit ritualistics are performed They've there. Conjured up some they, they conjured up some, I mean, some big stuff. I mean, I, I will tell you, well, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you the story. I, I was there. Uh, we were investigating about 15 years ago and it's a, it's it's an old it's a, it's a small cemetery but it's like a horseshoe shaped kind of there's a fence around it and all the sim the, the stones have been desecrated unfortunately of many of them and in the back there's a thing called the witch's tree and so there's a lot of people and it's a shame that they name it that but it is um it really should be called satanic tree because that's where they do the satanic rituals about this tree so some friends of mine, we were walking, it's only one path in, one path out. And there's about a four, three to four mile drive off the main road that you have to go to get to the cemetery. So nobody knows it even exists. And it's all black. It's complete dark. There's no lights. There's nothing back there. It is. And when you get off the main road, you can feel this place three miles before you even get there. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is that oppressive. It is that oppressive. But when we got there, we walked back to the uh, to the witch's tree and it was quiet. It was around midnight. It was dead silent. Not there. Was, it, was, it was the middle of, of summer. No crickets, nothing. It was just quiet. And then the trees right above us start swaying back and forth. But what was crazy is we felt no wind, no wind at all where we were down by the witch's tree, none. But the wind, it, it, it was like the, the trees were going to be breaking in half. And then we start hearing lots of like shuffles and we would see shadows, hundreds of shadows running around us like they were closing us off. And you get that like they were going from tree to tree. And we saw this. We actually all, we all saw this and they were closing us off and closing out and they were coming towards us. And here we are back here. And it was like they were closing us off to where we were trapped. And so we said, okay, we're not here. We're not prepared for this. So we got out of there. And as soon as we got to the outside of the cemetery, we turned around and someone flashed a flashlight on this tree. Now this tree, there was a full moon. It was shining very bright right behind this tree. And I don't know what this figure was. Even to this day, I don't know. It drives me crazy because I don't know what it was, but we, we all turned around we the shot person shot the figure or light right on this figure. It was a massive, and we all saw the same thing. It was a massive, looked like to me an eight to ten feet tall creature. Uh, it had like to me like almost a human figure, but it's it had wings. I mean, his wings were completely spread out, and we saw it. I and mean, this we could see the full moon right behind the thing. We we saw the whole entire silhouette, and we were shining a light on it, and it had red eyes. We all saw this thing, and one of the guys was so terrified they dropped a four hundred dollar camera. This is fifteen years ago, 
And that's how, that's how terrified they were. And so we got back in the car and we said, that's it. We're done. We're out of here. And we didn't talk about what we saw. And we, we finally got to our destination. We said, what did you see? We all described the exact same thing. Uh, some see, well, it was like 12 feet. Some people say it was a little, a little lower, but we all saw the same thing. And to this day, it, it had red eyes. It was looking right down at us. And it, it was letting us know without question that if you step foot, one more foot into the cemetery, you're done. I mean, it, it, there was no, it was, an, we all felt the same thing. So I don't know what that, I would love to know what that thing was. Nope, nope, you can have it. <laughs> but it, it was, it was, um, yeah, this, that, was a, that was an experience. That was an experience I'll never forget. But this was at the cemetery here, and this was during the day. Uh, and I know a lot of people argue about orbs, and I'm not going to argue whether or not um, uh, for or against orbs. However, he was uh, there's an investigator here, and just at this point where he passed this orb, um, he had a very interesting EVP. It was not a violent EVP. I think it said like hello or hey. Um, but it was class A EVP and it just as they passed. So you can argue, well, eh, well, is it human spirit? I don't know. Here's another picture that we found. Um, this was an interesting picture of during an investigation someone took. And you can argue uh, that this could be lens uh, from a camera, possibly. But there, wasn't, there was really no whole, a whole lot of other interference, light interference behind or in front of this person taking the picture. And they, these people have not, were not complaining about violent activity, just things closing and, you know, kind of making noises, that kind of stuff. Yeah, I've seen, I've seen green with my own eyes and yellow before, but um, not blue. Well, the, this is interesting. This orb here is interesting. And again, I, I don't, I'm not a big fan of orbs because a lot of them, most of them can be explained as dust. Mm -hmm. However, there are some things like this picture was um, was taken at the uh, governor's mansion, I believe the old governor's mansion in Kentucky, where someone was walking down the stairs and they tripped, they fell like someone had pushed them and someone immediately took a picture of that and that's what they saw, just as this person was, uh, was falling down. So I thought that was quite interesting. Uh, here's another picture, you see a, a blue light here. Uh, again, I, I don't really hold a lot of, you know, a lot of weight to that. Uh, this is a picture here uh, of a family, and you'll see this picture uh, of this little boy to the left. Now, what's interesting is I know the family who took this picture. This little boy passed away oh. before th this little boy wasn't in this picture. He had passed away when this picture was taken. And you can see, clearly see, uh, what he, uh, the picture that he was wearing were the same clothes that he was wearing on the day that he passed away. Wow. That's kind of so, it is it is mm -hmm. and again these are these are human spirits that we're talking about or ghosts that people refer to them as so the the ghost syndrome um there really are two type of hauntings if you really want to think about is residual and interactive mm -hmm. now residual let me just remind all of you who are watching residual is not interactive it's not intelligent so that's just energy so I, it's not hard to understand energy Think of it like this. You're walking down the street. You see somebody. You don't know this person, but you, you, you know you don't want to know that person. They don't have to say a word to you. You just want to say, no, you stay over there, and I'm staying over here. That's energy. Or the same way if a, if a person walks into a room, and they don't say a word. Just their mere presence. They walk into a room, and they light it up, and people just gravitate to them. That's energy. Even Einstein tried to explain energy. So that's what residual we're talking about. Residual energy is not interactive. It's not intelligent. It's many people think it is just something like a tape player being replayed over and over. And that's different than interactive. Interactive spirits is where they will actually communicate with you. So, you know, these are some things you can kind of pay attention to. Code spots, if you've ever investigated some code spots, a smell of, many people will smell fresh rain that I've spoken to um, or specific smells. And that is true. In every single exorcism that I have performed in the 30 that I have performed, I've always smelt roses. And the reason is, is my aunt, Mary, she loved roses, loved roses. That was, she, that she had a rose garden. And when she passed away, she, she just reminded us when you smell roses, you know, I'm there. 
And in every single exorcism before every single one, I'll get an overwhelming sense smell of roses. Just let me know that she's there. Before and the exorcism. You'll, before, you'll... Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm, I'm actually in the home preparing the rite itself. And then you'll just get this aroma of, of roses. And I have nothing. I have nothing that would, there are no incense. There's no uh, oil. There's nothing that I use at all that smells like roses. But everyone, everyone who is there will actually, you can smell it. It's, it's pretty overwhelming. Um, and then, then, then that's just human spirit, just letting them know, you know, hey, hey we're here. Mm -hmm. uh, I have also noticed from my, my I guess my investigations and, and my training, certainly my investigations, the, the huge difference between a human spirit and demonic spirit is a, is a human spirit does not have enough energy to manifest to push heavy objects. And really, that takes a tremendous amount of energy to do, tremendous amount. Because remember, they exist outside of time and space. Mm -hmm. So we exist within time or space. So in other words, we have space. We can't be in two places at once. And because our bodies are able to force an object, it's different than obviously with them being complete souls, spirits. So that's different than a demonic. Now, when a demonic moves something, it doesn't move to say, hey, look, look, look at what I can do. No, when it moves something, you're the target. And there is no, there, there are no limitations on what I mean, I've seen heavy, I've seen chairs. I've seen a couch literally being thrown out and hit the person right in the hip. I mean, literally so, someone had kicked it like a, a football player had kicked this couch and it just swung around and hit this person as hard as it could on, on this person's hip. And they went down. I mean, they, they, it, hit, it hit them hard, but that's, that was demonic. That was not human spirit. Uh, one of the things that I always have to tell people is if you're in a situation where you are, if people say, I force the spirit over, I really have a serious problem with that as a theologian, because here's what, and here's why that's very, first of all, if it's very egotistical, very egotistical. So if anyone ever says to you, well, I forced this spirit over. No, you didn't. <laughs> let, let's, let, let's, let's check the ego at the, at the door, because I, the people ask me, well, why do spirits remain? Well, they remain on earth because God doesn't force heaven upon us. I think God presents heaven to us. And we have that free will to either go to heaven or remain here for personal business for whatever reason. We have real attachments. I don't believe heaven is forced upon us. And I do believe that free will exists in heaven. I would actually say from a theological perspective, I can prove it. Demons exist. And demons are fallen angels. So therefore, free will must exist in heaven. I totally agree. And so... That's, that's one of the reasons. So when, if you have a human spirit, if you're doing an investigation, uh, and I don't know how many folks are, are investigators or brand new investigators who are watching this, because um, I can only see you guys, I would say to them, if you have a case where there's a human spirit that's, that is, is dwelling within the home that doesn't want to leave, just pray for them. Mm -hmm. Just simply pray for them and go to them with peace and love. Don't go there and I'm going to force you out. No. Okay. Let's okay. Rambo, let's take a chill pill and re let's, let's relax a little bit. Uh, just simply pray for that spirit and ask for, you know, just the forgiveness of sins and, and, and let them, and let them move on. Now I'm not going to go over talk too much about this poltergeist because I, I, this is what, this is one of the most important things I want to say about poltergeist po poltergeist is they're not ghosts. I have had poltergeist cases. I have worked many poltergeist cases. As a matter of fact, I have a doll that came from a home and I, this doll is not in my home. Um, I actually brought it to mid South Louisville, mid South paranormal convention. That probably wasn't the smartest thing, but people wanted to see some artifacts. So this play, this doll was purchased by a family and they, it was brought into their home. And this doll, within I think a week or two, the whole entire home completely burnt down. Com I mean, it, it, there was nothing left. There was no, no furniture, nothing. I mean, it was burnt to a crisp, except for this doll. Whoa. And you can see the doll that has actually burn marks on it, but that is the only thing that was there. And I knew the fire chief. 
So that was the only thing that was standing. And the family said, get it out of here. Well, I, we don't want it. So I actually, uh, people were asking about it and say, can we see it? So I, I, I put it in a container. I blessed it, um, blessed the container around it. I brought it and people did not. There were many well-known psychics there and they didn't want to touch it. They wouldn't, there were imp, uh, empaths there that wanted nothing to do with it. And so I, I, we talked a little bit about it and I, I forgot because someone had asked me a question, I forgot to place it back in its box. And instead I placed it right next to my computer. Mm. People who actually were there, they all saw my USB caught fire in the, in my laptop. And this is the USB that I use for all my demonology presentations. And they actually saw it. They actually saw it smoke. They saw that the, they were bishop, bishop, look, and I'm like, what's going on? And there it was, it, it, it literally caught fire, the USB in what was plugged up. And I use this USB, I use it everywhere. Never had a problem, never had a problem ever. And it destroyed the computer, completely destroyed the computer. Completely, the computer was, no, was uh, not operational. So it not only destroyed the USB, but it destroyed the computer as well. And, and that was, and it was just, as soon as I sat it down, I said this, and I remember telling, this is the dangers of this messing with these poltergeist cases. And I was talking and they were just freaking out because they saw the smoke coming from the, the computer. But this is the, that, by the way, the fire is the number one destruction for poltergeist. And poltergeist, it technically means noisy ghost. It's not a ghost, it's energy that a person who is going through extreme emotional stress is going through. So especially now you have a lot of families fighting. You have a lot of issues with even people losing their homes and losing paychecks and uh, divorces. And there's a lot of, a lot of activity that mimics demonic activity, but it's not because once you bring the person out of the home, that's going through that um, emotional stress. If you take them out of the home, the activity stops, or, or at least it, it's to a point where you it's manageable. But then you bring them right back into the home and the activity increases again. So I can perform a million minor right of exorcisms there and it will do nothing on a poltergeist. I do want to say there's a difference between the solemn right of exorcism and the minor right of exorcism. The solemn right of exorcism is performed on an individual who is validly possessed. The minor right of exorcism is an exorcism that's performed on a demonic entity or malevolent spirit that has infested itself within a home or building. You do not perform an exorcism on a building. That doesn't exist. Yeah. You perform a blessing on a building, but you perform the exorcism on the malevolent or demonic spirit. Okay, so that's the difference between the minor rite of exorcism and the solemn rite. That's great information. So many times we, I've seen on the, the paranormal shows like this building has had an exorcism. This house has had an exorcism. So that's BS basically. It, absolutely BS it, uh, because it, and any, and anybody who's validly trained in this would not ever would they would never say they perform an exorcism on a home. You bless the home. You perform an exorcism on an entity that's that's infested itself in the home. Two, it's it's not the same thing. So, and now then you have deliverance. So you have the solemn rite of exorcism. Someone is possessed, and then you have a deliverance. A deliverance is someone who's under the stage of oppression. So they go out. They investigate. They say, come on, you know, if you're so tough, do something for me. I dare you. I dare you. Touch me. Or That's all it needs. That's the invitation it needs. That's the invitation demonic entities need. Okay. The minute you say, come on, do something, the demonic entity is looking at you and saying, I will. When you're lonely and you're sick and your wife leaves you or your husband leaves you or you lose your job, then I provoke back. So you got to understand that they will provoke back and they do it in a way that is completely destructive. And so I'm going to tell you guys, you guys are paying nothing for this. I'm getting paid for nothing for this. I don't get paid for this at all. I've been doing this for 20 years. I told you I have a doctorate and three master degrees. If I didn't know, that possession existed, I'd be doing something else with my time. Making a it's lot of money. Making a lot of money, especially in corporate America. Mm -hmm. So I, I got to tell you guys, because of what I've seen, I can't walk away from this. 
because I know what I have seen. I know what I witnessed. And so my job is to try to teach people so that they don't have to go through what I go through. Um, I will live under oppression for the rest of my life. And I will be oppressed until the day I die. And so that's something that I, I'm. Yeah. <clears throat> You've got God on your side, though. So. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah it, 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 and that is true. However, however, that doesn't mean that I won't have my trials and tribulations. True. I was 400. I was 420 pounds. I was dying. When I did exorcism live, I was dying. Mm. And that is, and, 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 the, and the sad part about it is I, I drink all, only water. I drink no sodas, no sugary drinks at all, just water. That's all I drink. I don't like uh, chocolate or sweets because it causes, it triggers my migraines because I suffer from concussions from playing football. So I don't, I, I don't like to eat a lot of sweets because of that. Mm -hmm. I, I don't um, carbohydrates and all that. I literally, what I've eaten today are two waffles and a turkey sandwich. That's what I've eaten. And I was 420 pounds. Let me tell you a story about oppression. Oppression is when the demonic entity now knows that you exist and they know that you know they exist. And so they're going to make your life a living hell. They're going to attack your intellect and will. So you go out and you have a case and it's a true demonic case. And now the demonic says, oh, hello, John. I didn't know you existed. Well, now I do. And so now, John, or if you're listening out there, or Sam, or uh, Harry, or Mary, or Larry, the point is, is the demonic will begin to attack you. It will affect your intellect and will. And that's to a point where you really, truly think you're going crazy. You think that there's something wrong. I'm going to uh, stop the this, this share real, real quick because I want to, uh, I don't know how to stop the share, actually. I'll just do it this way. There. <laughs> I hope I did that all right. Did I do it right that time? Um, because I want to talk about um, the stages, and this is very, very important that people understand the type of activity, demonic activity. There are two types of demonic activity. There's extraordinary, and then there's ordinary demonic activity. And so when you're dealing with ordinary demonic activities, that's where the demonic entity will say, oh, come on, you can have one more drink. I'll come, you know, hey, look, that, that, that person over there, they look pretty good. And you're married. Come on, just go say hello. Or just spend another dollar, just another five dollars at the at the at the at the at the wheel at, at, at lottery. You got it. Another hundred dollars. You're going to win it. That's ordinary demonic activity. The seven deadly sins. Extraordinary demonic activity. Now, that's actually into four categories. You have demonic infestation where the demonic has infested your home. So you're a paranormal investigator or new, and you go out and you say, okay, is there anyone here? Can you please make a noise? Can you please do something? Now you've just invited into your life. That's the invitation that it needs. So now it comes home. Now you have an attachment and you come home and the demonic has infested itself within the home. You hear loud bangings, religious objects are desecrated. Uh, animals are terrified. There is a horrible foul odor. Uh, again, religious objects are, are thrown around. I mean, literally, they're thrown around. You know something bad is in that home. There's no question something as evil is there. That's demonic infestation. Now you are the target. So what it does, that's demonic oppression. Demonic oppression is when it begins to physically attack you. Think about this. You have no sleep anymore. And when you try to sleep, it pulls your hair or it scratches you, or bites you, or pinches you, or pulls your cover off of you. And it's constant. It is constant. Now, just imagine, constant. There is no break. And the, 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 a week could go by, and your body just basically is shutting down because your immune system is getting weak. You have no sleep. You can't sleep. It is affecting your very, very will to even push forward. Then you have demonic, what's called demonic obsession. And that's when it begins to attack you on a mental level. Hey, nobody loves you. You're stupid. Don't talk to anybody about this because they, they're, 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 they're going to put you in a crazy home. And so it's what it's doing now is isolating you from your family, and your friends. So the very people that you would talk to and say, hey, I need some help. No, 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 no. Don't talk to them. 
Don't, don't be stupid. They're, they're going to put you in a, in a crazy house. Don't do that. So it's breaking down the intellect. And it gets to the point where you can no longer, you literally are beyond the exhausted part. And your body is, can, can't fight possession. And so that is, those are the official stages to when it gets, actually gets into the uh, possession. And so you have to be careful. That's why I always tell people you have to be careful. Don't ever get into the first stage by going to a demonic entity and saying, hey, you know, come on, if, you, if you're there, uh, I want you to do something. I dare you to do something. So just don't, don't do that. Any questions so far? I know it's a lot of information. This is a lot of information, but that's what you guys came here for. So that's hey, I'm <laughs> loving it, but I'm sleeping with the lights on tonight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, uh, just as long as you don't, uh, as long as you don't invite and, and, and Ouija yeah. guys, stop, leave the Ouija boards alone. Leave them alone. Mm -hmm. Look, I, I understand people are going to say, well, I'll bitch up long. You're just no, that, that, that I could, okay, this phone, this phone I could use as a portal. Mm -hmm. This phone right here, because there are apps right now that you could use to mm -hmm. communicate with the spirit world. Mm -hmm. That's opening a portal. The same way with, if you had a Ouija board, you're using it for the sole purpose. Now, the phone was not created to make contact with the dead or the spirit world. The phone was connected for you to say, hello, how are you doing? And then hang up. But the Ouija board, the sole purpose of the Ouija board was created for you to make contact with the spirit world. That's the big difference between the two. And here's the problem. We tell paranormal investigators, don't speak to strangers. We tell kids, don't speak to strangers. But paranormal investigators doing it all the time. So if you go to a place, a graveyard or a haunted location, and you're using one of these apps or you're using the Ouija board, I don't care what anybody tells you. And if people are not going to like this. I don't care. If they say to you, I can, I can sprinkle fairy dust on the board and nothing is going to come through. A demonic entity doesn't give a damn about your fairy dust and they don't give a damn about your white light. You can surround yourself with white light all you want to, but you can't have your cake and eat it too. You can't sit there and say, I'm going to surround myself with white light, but I'm also going to invite a demonic entity into my life and then say, oh, can't, oh you can't hurt me. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work. I'm Guys, I, I, if you don't believe me, then go find out for yourself and I'll give you my number and you'll be needing my services because I'm telling you, I'm telling you, I'm pleading with you. Stop, stop it. Because I, I can't tell you how many cases uh, there have been thousands of cases that I have worked where people played with Ouija boards and they didn't know it. You know, they didn't know they were doing something wrong. They didn't, they, they just, it was, it was kind of like, they just wanted to see. And I, I get that, they, you know, they didn't want to make contact with the, with a demonic entity. They just wanted to make contact maybe with the see if anything comes through. And I understand that, but you got to understand a demonic entity doesn't care what your intent is. A demonic entity doesn't care if you want to try to make a contact with aunt Sally. And actually, if you want to make what contact with aunt Sally, the demonic entity would say, Oh, I'm, I'm aunt Sally. Uh-huh. I'm Aunt Sally right here. Are you Aunt Sally? Oh, yes. Yes, I'm Aunt Sally. And before you know it, you're communicating with something you think is Aunt Sally until the moment you say, make a noise, do something, say, that's the invitation. It says, okay, I'll see you tonight. Y'all paying attention to this? Everybody listening? <laughs> I, 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 the, I, Telling dead people this for you ever. It, 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 it no matter how many times I preach this, people still do it. And I don't, under, and then they get upset if they don't, and then they don't get it. They get upset if they don't come across a demonic entity. Are you insane? That's like saying, well, I'm going to, I'm on a diving board and there's a, a huge pool of water of great white sharks who hadn't been fed in a month. And I jump in the, uh, the, the pool and none of the sharks bite me. I am so angry about that. It's, it's, it's the most insane thing in the world. These are predators. These the demonic entities are predators and they will stop at nothing to harm you. 
nothing. They violate every moral code you can possibly think. They trick you into thinking that you're a friend. They trick you to think that they're your past relative. They trick you to think that they're a child. They trick you into so many ways to, to lure you in. You don't even realize you're the prey until it's too late. And I, and I use that term specifically because on my first exorcism that I've done, I was, I was not the chief exorcist. I was the assistant and we were walking up the stairs and it was very similar to the exorcist movie. Very, very eerie. Um, it was over. It was just overwhelming. And I had studied all my life in demonology, very structured in, in theology classes, Roman seminary. But when I got up there, um, I knew that this was not something that was normal that this was this was going to change my life forever and it did and so we got we went into the room and she was sitting up and she wasn't making any noise at all she was just sitting up and we began we were doing the litany of the saints we were walking up the stairs and we began to do the ritual and she just simply laid back just simply laid back there was no it was almost as the demonic was saying okay i'm ready for you and she would lay back into her bed and during the ritual it calls for the exorcist to lift the eyelids to check to see where we are in the possession. And so you got to be very careful with that because during an exorcism that the person is possessed, and if you don't watch your fingers, they could literally bite the fingers off because they have superhuman strength. So they could literally rip your fingers off. Master, and what were you looking for at, with the people? What were you looking for? The dilation. And then, and then it, it becomes solid black. Uh, so yeah. I, I wanted to see, I wanted to see where the pupils were, if they were dilating or not. And so when I lift the eyes, they, they were dilating pretty rapidly. It was dilating, it was dilating, coming back and dilating. And I knew, okay, we were getting, we were going into this. And then when it expanded and then expanded even more, and it was just solid black, mm -hmm. solid. Now I've read about solid black eyes. I have, I've, I've studied it all my life. I've been mentored by exes who've told me about this stuff, but until you ex until you experience it, I hope you never do. Uh, it is not, it is, I can't, oh, there are no words that I can use to describe it except for I could not move because I looked at, I looked at the eyes and you're never supposed to look at the eyes. And I found out why. And as I lift the eyelids up and I saw the solid black, that kind of threw, it, it, it shocked me. It was like, I, I'd read about it, but when you see it, but it was a blackness that was like a mirror. I could see my own, I could see my own reflection, but the only way to describe it is I was looking in the eyes of, of my predator and I couldn't move. I couldn't think I couldn't, <clears throat> I was completely catatonic and, and there was no, I wasn't, you know, I, I, I try, I try to describe this the other day to somebody. Um, it really, it felt like, okay, I'm looking at the predator and I know that I'm prey. I know there's nowhere that I can run. And so it was like, a, okay, well, I, I, I'm preparing. It was like, I'm, I'm preparing for the, the jaws to come clamping down. And that is what it felt like. Total hopelessness. A total hopeless. No, there's, there it is complete hopelessness. And it was a predator. It, it, it looked like a predator like a great white shark looking right back back at me saying you're my next meal and so uh, the my exorcist the, the chief exorcist then grabbed me by the collar and he did a deliverance on me and you know the, the the demonic was mocking but we continued he did the deliverance and we continued the ministry because i had that attachment immediately and so we continued um the right but that was I'll never forget that. I'll never, I have, I have nightmares about that. I'll, I'll be honest. I, I suffer from severe, uh, severe nightmares because of the stuff that I've seen, because this, I've seen a person literally look at me at, during an exorcism and will, turn their body, turn their hand like this, their arm like this, and just simply looked at me. There was no expression. It was complete, ex like stoic, no expression on the face. And they kept twisting and twisting and snap out of this horrible crack. And I just knew that he had just broken his arm. Just, he, he wasn't touching it with the other arm, with the other hand. He, it, demonic was just simply twisting and twisting and twisting and twisting. And there was no grimace on his face. And then when I heard that snap, he just simply looked. 
there was nothing there. And that was just to remind me of the force that he had, that if he could have that body do whatever it wanted, then there's no telling what it could do to me. So it was trying to intimidate me. And I would. <laughs> it, and, and it, and, and well, and it's, you know, it, it, it tries to get in your mind. It tries to, it is because the intellect and will of the exorcist and the intellect and will of the possessed are a battle. Yeah. So we're, we're both battling and, and one is going to win. One's going to lose. And that's the way it goes. So that was, um, that was a, a, a wake up call as well. Uh, you know, when you see these things uh, it is, it's, it's quite violent, quite violent. And I, I have also worked incubus and succubus cases. And uh, folks, I'm telling you something. If you ever, ever speak to somebody who says, well, and, and this is the new thing going on now. It really is. This is happening. And it's, it, it makes me so angry. But there are people now who say, well, I really want my own demon for sexual pleasure. Oh, God. Yeah. And that's, that's really becoming a, a thing. And, and people welcome incubus and succubus into their lives. Um, and then they're going to end up in perfect possession because they welcome this type of activity. And incubus and succubus are not something you welcome. They are violent. Mm -hmm. And I'll, I'll tell you, there's a, a case that I worked. She's 68 years old and she was like my grandmother. I loved her dearly. And, but when I got involved with her, um, and if there's children listening, they shouldn't be listening right now because the, what I'm about to say is probably is, is definitely not for them. So if you're, if you have kids there, I, I'll just kind of hold off for just two seconds. Maybe you can kind of, uh, if anyone has kids, uh, they shouldn't be listening to this anyway, because it's, it's, it, this is serious stuff. This is, this is dangerous stuff, but I, I will tell you. Um, so hopefully by that time, you kind of got the kids out of the out. When I got involved with this case, she had been ripped apart in her private area and her anal area. Mm. She was in the hospital. She required stitches. Um, she described it as being a plunger being used. And this was by Santeria. This was a curse that was placed upon her. Yeah. Yeah. And it was very, she described them as bed walkers. So she would be getting ready to go to sleep. And then she described them as three pound dogs, three, three, 10 pound dogs. And, and, and three, that's a form of mockery of the trinity mm -hmm. just like i told zach in, in, when he would the ghost adventures i said zach well the reasons you have three scratches is because of the mocking of the trinity and so there that's why they have there was three of these dogs that she described and it would walk slowly towards her and then it would hold her down and she'd be awake she's awake she's not this is not sleep paralysis she is completely awake and it begins to attack her violently and it's not an actual physical um, sexual assault. It's a manipulation of the muscles to the point where it contrasts so severe that it rips the internal muscles and even the external parts of the body. And that is how violent it gets. Um, I had one gentleman that I worked with who was a soldier and uh, he had a succubus case and he described it as a hammer being used to his private region. And re he required surgery. Um, yeah, those are very violent cases. They, I, I worked with the 68 year old for quite some time. She'd been suffering for five years with this and I worked with her for about three years. And the last, the last year of her life, she was no longer being sexually assaulted. She still sometimes felt the bed walkers, but they wouldn't touch her. And then when she passed away, her family asked me to perform her funeral. And that was, that was very hard for me to do. Because I, I loved her. She was just mm -hmm. one of those, you know, come on in, let me give you a hug. But what she went through was was pure hell. So in incubus and succubus cases, they, they are legitimate. They are real. They're very violent. And you should just simply stay away from that. I would just Can simply say. explain the difference yeah. between those two for people? Well, the incubus and succubus? Yes. What the yeah. Are. yeah, the incubus and succubus, uh, an incubus will attack um, a female. So what, here's what will happen. Incubus will attack a female and succubus will attack a male. Mm -hmm. What will happen is um, there is some type usually of, of Santeria or a curse or um, a, a welcoming. So like, for example, you're playing with Ouija boards, you're doing anything and you, you welcome accidentally even this demonic into your life. Um, the, the, the sexual pleasure at first is not violent. 
um, it, it can be described as a very pleasurable experience. And even the next time, a very pleasurable experience. And then it gets to a point where it becomes, um, because remember, that's not their point. Their, their, their goal is not to continue to give you happiness and pleasure. That's not the point. Uh, the, the goal is to break your intellect and will down. So they're going to do it by now. It's every night. And now it's all the time, two or three times. And it, even now it's, now it's happening during the day. And it becomes very intrusive to the point where you say, okay, stop. You're, you're affecting this is this is this is not this is not normal I, I command you in the name of jesus i command you in the name of god get out of here and leave and that's when the demonic says oh no 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 i'm not going anywhere because you invited me so i'm staying for a little bit longer and that's when it becomes very very violent and aggressive and so that's the difference and and, and incubus and succubus the, we're talking about demonic entities that have been around for quite some time these are not the demonic entities that just recently have been identified i mean we i mean we we, we see the, even the middle eastern beliefs um for many many years ago that uh these these creatures exist or these demonic entities existed so this is something that um has been around for quite some time they're very ancient and they're very violent they're very violent and so i would say that anytime you have something like this it, it, that it's unnatural you have to put a stop to that uh, because if not, then then the activity could become quite violent. The point that I always want to try to make to people is stay away from any type of tools that allow you to communicate with spirits. Now, if you're going to investigate, because paranormal investigators, I work with a lot of the paranormal investigators, they'll say, well, what, what, well, how are we supposed to do this? If we have digital recorders, I mean, can we even use that? Or can we, well, we can't use any equipment. Well, I always do preliminary questions first. So if I use my phone or if I use any type of gadget, digital recorder, anything, when I'm doing investigation, I will say, do you confess Yahweh is your God? Or, or do you kneel before the cross of Jesus? Uh, do you um, bow before God uh, for eternity? And or something of this, I, I will ask three questions that refer to the Trinity. And I got a very class A EVP once. Do you confess Yahweh? Yahweh is the Hebrew name for God. And so I say, do you confess Yahweh is your God? And I got a class A. Class A is perfect. Like I, you can hear my voice now. And the answer was hell no. And I said, well, okay then. So now it's time for me to go to work because now I know what I'm dealing with here. And so, I mean, it was a class A EVP. And so that's when I knew, okay, we can't proceed because there's at least a malevolent spirit here, if not a demonic. So then I had to perform the minor rite of exorcism. All right. Um, Can I go back to a quick question on the incubus and succubus? Yep. Okay. One question I have just from a case that I was working on do they attack in pairs oh, or sure. is it just three? Because that's the one question we had. We weren't sure that if, you know, do, you know, or any demon, do they attack in pairs? Yeah, absolutely. They do. I, absolutely. And, and I have seen, I have seen a demonic a possession occur where it was multiple possession. It wasn't just simply a one demonic entity. And so during the rite, the exorcist commands, once the intellect and will of the demonic begins to fade and they become weakened, then we force the entity to manifest its name. So you, you got to let us know, because once you have the name, then you have control of, of the demonic. And so uh, there's been several times where I've had in my 30 cases that there've been multiple demonics that have possessed the body. That's like, it's a pack of dogs. It's, it's, they're opportunists and, and they're parasites. They're cowards, but they will, they will attack at the most opportune time. And that's absolutely multiple can attack at once. Yeah, um, there it's it's <laughs> there's a lot of information to, and I know some people are like, "Whoo, okay, <laughs> maybe you didn't want to know all this." <laughs> um, can, we, can we keep doing your um, PowerPoint because everybody's wanting that posted online? Everybody's like, "Where can we get the slides?" And I'm like, "Oh, well, we'll post the video." <laughs> Well, yeah, the information that I'm giving you now is not necessarily from the slides right now. It's just for it's from my, my knowledge that, that I'm sharing. But yeah, I will share. I'll, I'll let me pull up uh, demonic entities in human spirits. Let me share uh, some screenshots here. So there we go. Uh, all right. So we're going to go into inhuman spirits, otherwise known as demonic entities. Um, people ask, well, why? Why? 
why demonic infestation? Well, you could have had a pre-existing infestation. So you move into a home or perhaps maybe someone did some things they, they shouldn't have done, invited a demonic into, into the home. Uh, that is quite possible. Uh, also, someone could open themselves up again by Ouija board. Uh, paranormal inv investigators, as I mentioned many times, they do this all the time. So this is why infestation can occur. I always tell people, you know, you could have the most, uh, most expensive equipment in the world uh, doing investigations on demonic entities. And really, you're going to find yourself to be in, in uh, unfortunately, um, a precarious situation. I knew, there was a guy uh, who had a $14,000 FLIR camera. Something, it, was, oh, he, it was ridiculous. About, this is when they first came out. And, oh, he was so happy about this. And I told him, I said, you just wasted your money. Well, what do you mean i wasted my money this is the best of the best well i'm sure it is but as soon as you go into this place it's demonically infested your battery is going to be drained in a second and wouldn't you know it? he had a fourteen thousand dollar camera that sat in the corner because the batteries kept draining so fast because the energy the the spirits there that were trying to take that energy to manifest to use to take that to, so they can manifest themselves because it takes a great deal of energy to manifest it's a great deal of energy whereas a demonic entity can and human spirits will absorb that energy so fast. So any type of batteries are drained quickly. But I always tell people when it comes to demonic entities, pay close attention to your sixth sense. You're going to know if something isn't right. Mm -hmm. If you go do an investigation and, and your gut's saying, get out of there, then leave. I'll tell you what we learn in the seminary. You never act with a doubtful conscience. You may allow an evil to occur. So what that means is you're, you're the investigator, you're the team lead, you have a doubtful conscience, you think there could be something evil in that home. You think there could be, you enter that home with a doubtful conscience, you can allow an evil to occur, someone could get hurt. And that's on your watch. So never act with a doubtful conscience, you may allow an evil to occur. So follow your sixth sense. In, in, uh, also, demonic spirits, uh, the outward signs of demonic possession, these are some outward signs here. Uh, objects will, will move around, but they don't move around to say, hey, look, look at what I can do. They move around for the sole purpose of, of, of frightening you, and you're the target. Uh, whereas a human spirit, when they move things, they move things just to let you know they're there. But it's not a violent move. It's not a violent move. And also human spirits, I've never, ever, ever, ever had a case where a human spirit was able to manifest enough energy to toss a, a chair across the, a, the a heavy chair across the room or a couch. I've never seen that. Never in my life. And I've seen, I've been to thousands of cases. Now, demonic cases, demonic can, because they're not limited to that type of energy. So religious objects will be desecrated. Um, just kind of, pay, you know, pay attention to this, some outwards, uh, some, some growls. I've been cases where I've heard horrible growls and uh, you can't locate the source, uh, scratching sounds, uh, again, heavy furniture will move on its own for the sole purpose of either hurting you or causing you stress. These are really important. Uh, animals, guys, Animals are amazing. Uh, a lot of animals will be able to tell you if there's something. Uh, I had a, um, I had a, a dog. She was very, very benign. She, she was not aggressive at all. But boy, when she went into some places, the hair and the stood on the back of her neck, and, and I knew then it was time to go. And she was a great Pyrenees, and so she, yeah, she was. She certainly knew. Um, here are some more things, but we're not going to go into a whole lot of this because we're already past, way past an hour. Um, we're good. <laughs> okay. Um, this is, uh, this actually is, a, a, a picture that was taken by my team that I was working with. This is Sally house in Kansas, and this is upstairs. Now what you're looking at is a mirror is a window on the second floor. Now there it's impossible for anyone to be standing out there because there's no ledge. But on the inside, this picture was taken on the inside. You see the reflection of a human spirit mm -hmm. here and another picture of it. But so someone took them, took this picture behind them facing the window. And this is what we saw looking in. And someone had an amazing computer program. They were able to enhance it and to uh, either color and color coordinate that. It was amazing what they did. And this is what they came up with. Oh, Lord. Mm-hmm. And that was from the Sally house. 
And Sally House is very, very well known to be one of the most demonic, violent cases uh, in the United States. So, yeah, the team went there to investigate. You can see here. And that's what they came. It's pretty, pretty, pretty intense. Uh, we showed this uh, to the owners of the Sally House. And, yeah, they they were very interested in seeing this. Um, okay, so I'm going to in here i'm going to in stop there and let me ask let me get to any questions because i know there's probably going to be hundreds or maybe lots of questions before we could be into to, to the midnight hour um i'll go through uh, heather do you want to start with some i mean i've got like you know <laughs> yeah i can go through the ones i have and then i've been writing some down from the chat yeah, as sure. we've been going um where did it go i'm looking at oh one question from the chat was can parasitic entities are they demonic or do they act as demonic? Can who know? Parasitic entities? Yeah, well, there's a theory on parasitic. I mean, really, a lot of people would actually call um, demonic entities paras parasites. And so I, I think I have seen people who have had cases where they would define um, parasitic entities. And quite honestly, it's, it's very similar to the demonic. Um, but I, I don't know. There, there, there's a there's a theory uh, behind that, and there there's some people who are um, who are not an, a big fan of parasitic uh, entities. There's a people like, for example, people will define them as spiritual vampires, um, or people. And spiritual vampires are not the vampires that can actually absorb the blood, but they you know they do it through their energy. So. I have been to I have been to uh, places uh, paranormal conferences where there have been people who've claimed to be psychic vampires or what some many people would call would consider as parasitic. Uh, they, they're parasites. They feed off your energy. And it, I will tell you that there have been times where I was exhausted. I was just drained like I had just ran a marathon and many people believe that people were just trying to absorb people's energy there. So uh, I, I think if, if that, if, the, okay, so let me just say this, cause I'm trying to be very cautious about it and, and nice, but I will say this, if you are a, let's say a psychic vampire, which many people would define you as a parasitic entity, then I would say if you're absorbing people's energy without their permission, you're doing something immoral and unethical and you need to, you need to knock it off. But, but again, the, 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 uh, I would also say that the, uh, that's a theory as far as psychic vampires. And for me, I haven't seen as much evidence to hundred percent prove that they exist. I've spoken to people that truly believe they are, but I need to see the absolute proof, you know, and then one question I actually had from a case that we were working on a while back is, um, can shadow people or other entities influence or control demons? No, not control okay. demons. No, no, absolutely not. Well, you're, you're, if, you're, if you're dealing with a human spirit versus a demonic entity, no. The demonic entity does, they, you have to understand the sole purpose of a demonic entity is to hurt God. <laughs> and that's why possession occurs. Because how can you hurt God? The only way you can hurt God is by hurting the ones God loves us, which is uh, which is us. So God loves us absolutely unconditional. So that's the only way to hurt God. And another question from the chat is, who decides an exorcism is needed? Who actually makes the final decision? Well, the United States Old Catholic Church, I do. Okay. Uh, but I would also, I also still, I'm the coadjutor to the presiding archbishop, and I, I still... Um, you know, have a vow of obedience. I take a vow of obedience. Coadjutor means equal uh, to, but I would not, um, if there is a case, I go to him and I go to our council and I say, look, there's a case here and it, it warrants our attention. This could be legitimate. And so, because I, they, they, I asked them to pray for me during the exorcism. So I let them know what time it starts and the church is actively engaged in prayer as well. And uh, do people know they're possessed? Yeah, that's a great question. They, they know when they're in the possessed state, and unless you're in a, a full, a perfect possession, when you are in perfect possession, you're, you are aware because it's a, like a union, you welcome it, which is absolutely stupid. Um, 
but in people who have possess uh, possession and they don't welcome it, they don't want it. Uh, many of them have described it as a catatonic state. So they don't, they, they remember the attacks. They remember the attacks on the intellect and will. They remember the sleep uh, deprivation. They remember that. And they remember all the things that led up to the exorcism or to the uh, possession, but the actual possession itself, it's like they, they, they described it to me as like it was going to sleep. Okay. And then do entities try to disguise the fact that it's a possession from people like you or other exorcists? Oh, yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, because the last thing that a demonic entity wants is an exorcism to occur. So they want to prolong the agony. They want to prolong the suffering of the individual who's possessed. Okay. And then on what do you do or how do you handle if someone comes back with a actual psych evaluation or a medical evaluation that shows it's not possibly demonic? I guess, how do you well, explain that to them? Well, see, on a psychological evaluation, they wouldn't the, the, the psychological evaluation would not determine whether or not the psychiatrist would not determine that it's demonic. That would be, that would, that comes from the exorcist. The, the, the psychological evaluation that I'm looking at is determining whether or not the person is suffering from a mental illness. So I, I guess that's, I need clarification for the question because oh. the, the actual licensed psychiatrist wouldn't determine if it's demonic or not. Right. I guess it's if the psychological report comes back that they do have issues. Oh yeah. Well, that, well that's, yeah. and see, you, this is, and that's a great question. It really is because this really is a Pandora box. This is, it, it, it really does create a, a serious problem. And I'll tell you why there are people who do have mental illnesses who can be possessed. And so this is where an exorcist will then have to say, okay, what evidence do we have to absolute con without question that, that we can conclude that this person is possessed because psychological value, if you're psychologically ill, that doesn't make you levitate. It doesn't make you speak in, in languages that you're not known. It doesn't make you superhuman strength. It could, but you, you, the, a, a person who's mentally ill won't know your sins. They can't mimic the voice of deceased loved ones, which I've had before. They can't. So there are certain things that they cannot do that is that are that absolutely has nothing to do with psychological illnesses so if that was if that occurred then we would have to look at the whole thing oh. and um where do demons go and what prevents them from attaching to someone else yeah right that's a great question and, and revelation talks about that the demonic entities once expelled will be suffering for eternity into the lake of sulfur and that's why in revelation you you smell sulfur all the time when it comes to demonic uh because they know they know their origin and they know where they're going to go because the intellect and will of the demonic is being crushed and they eventually have to uh, with a cross with the crucifix and the relics that we use and the oil and the holy water we break the intellect and will down to uh, it, it eventually it eventually accept its fate and it bows down it, it, it to its own intellect and will to the cross and so it knows it knows it's its final resting place and it's not uh, one to be uh to to want i certainly that's why they fight so vibrant i mean i mean they fight with with all with all power that they have because they know where they're going to go okay and then one question that i actually get asked all the time from clients and other people who talk to me about this stuff is demons do they attack the non-religious or those who don't believe in demons Absolutely, they do. And I've, I had an atheist who was uh, who had an attachment and uh, I worked with him and he was no longer an atheist. And do, do, do. Because have, let, me, let, oh, let, me tell you, let me tell you this, this is important to note. I know some atheists who are more Christian than people who are self-proclaimed Christian who go to church every Sunday. And then immediately, as soon as they leave the church, they're condemning everybody to hell. So the closer you get to God, the harder the devil works against you. And so people who are atheists, who show love and compassion to those who they, they come and they meet, whether they know it or not, they're growing closer to God by their compassion. And so therefore, that makes them a target. Okay. And then I have a couple more questions, but I'll just cover one more before I let Philip get through his list. Um, there was an investigation. I know you were talking about how human entities really can't summon up the strength mm -hmm. to do major movements, 
Well, there was one case we were working on where we kind of just deemed it and closed it out as just a, like a trickster type spirit that was just there causing tricks and stuff like that. But during the investigation, I actually had my feet swiped out from underneath me and it flipped me in the air. Could that actually have been just a demonic entity that we might have been dealing with and didn't know it? That is extreme energy, extreme energy to do something like that. Um, I would really uh, go back and I would listen to every single and watch every evidence that you have uh, in that case, because that takes the, the, the energy that it takes to manifest. It just, it, it is extreme. So that I would say in that case, that's probably one of the rarest situations that I've ever heard of a human spirit. Now I've heard people that might've been pushed off balance um, and even kind of some scratch, but not to an extreme level, but you could feel it. Um, but nothing where it actually can little swift. I mean, just completely take your legs from out from underneath you. And you had mentioned something about can shadows uh, force demonic entities to stay, you know, stay in the lower level or, you know, stay in the, in, in, in the outside of the ring, if you will. Um, well, if, if, if the shadow that you're seeing actually is a demonic entity, that is a higher ranking angel. Absolutely. It can. So okay. there's hierarchy even in demonic entities. Okay. Perfect. Philip, if you want to ask some of yours. Um, yeah. Uh, do all demons have names? Yes. Where do the names come from? Well, ancient. I mean, they're, they're ancient. You look at, um, uh, gosh, and, and even what their, their intent is. So if you look at the, uh, their intent, what they do, I, I don't ever mention names. So I, I, that's, um, I try to stay away from that as much as I can. And, and the reason is it's simple. Anytime you start mentioning names of demonic, and I'll tell you why. Hey, Philip. Philip. Yes, I'm here. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So, so that's why I stay away from any type of um, names. And I, I, I'm careful about how much information I divulge into that because people will then look it up and then they'll try to summon. I did that one time where I taught, so I, I mean, I, I was new at this as far as giving presentation. This was long, 18 years ago. And someone asked me that question. And I said, well, yes, yeah, this particular demonic entity whose name is this. And then these people, this team took that name and tried to summon it with a Ouija board and all hell broke loose. And they contacted me and they were like, we didn't know it was going to happen. It's like, <laughs> oh, my really, seriously, and why uh, try it? <laughs> don't say their names. <laughs> I got a question from someone in chat. Um, if someone commits suicide while being possessed, can their soul be saved? Uh, see, that's a problem. They're possessed. So they have no constant. They have no, the question so it's itself. Their soul that's committing the suicide is not uh, their spirit. No, 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 no. But, but see, that's the problem. You have to have intent. Okay. And so um, the person is no longer in charge. The person is in a catatonic state. And so therefore you have to have the intent. You have to have the intent behind the action in order for it to be a sin. You have to know that it's a sin. You have to know that it is evil and still commit that act in order for it to be a sin. And that's Roman Catholic church doctrine the teaching on sin. So just to let you guys know about where that, that, that comes from, but the person who is possessed is in a catatonic state and they have no control of their bodily function. They really have no memory. The people that I have talked to, they don't have a memory of being possessed. So if, if in fact that possession or if that um, uh, something happened to the body, um, then that's, that's on the demonic and for eternity that, that in, in the end, that demonic will suffer the consequences for it. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, can they now, manifest now, into now let, let me okay. say something real fast because this is important there's a difference between full possession and transient possession so this is important everybody so that's i got it i need to clarify this when you're in full possession there is no break like annalise mckell who's emily rose the, the emily rose story um her name is annalise mckell and now she was in transient possession so that means a demonic entity will attack the body and attack the will and the intellect and the possession would occur and then the demonic would leave and then it, it would come back and then it would leave so when it left there were times where she was in a complete rational state of mind she knew where she she was not possessed at that moment now if that person commits suicide at that moment 
then that's a different story. But I, but I got, I, I'm really careful about this because I know that some of your viewers might have had family members who have committed suicide. And let me just say this to you. I don't advocate suicide. Suicide is not the answer under no circumstances is the answer. But I will say that when someone commits suicide, they're not thinking rationally. And in order for a sin to be committed, you have to have rational thought and know that the sin is evil. And so do you honestly believe if you have, and I'm speaking to anybody out there who's had a loved one who's committed suicide, because I think this is absolutely crucial, because you need to hear this from a bishop. Do you honestly believe that an all-loving God who only wants the best for us will condemn your loved one to hell because they were not thinking rationally, because they were going through extreme emotional stress, they made a very irrational decision, and they were not in the right state of mind. Do you think that he would condemn them to hell? I do not believe so. Not either. Uh, I do not. I, but, but there's a difference. Mm -hmm. it's, but, but, but knowing that it's wrong, and you shouldn't do it, and you know it's evil, and still committing that act. Now that that's 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 a whole different ball game, right? But if you're truly not in your right state of mind, and that's that's called temporal insanity, uh, so or, or basically lucid interval, and lucid interval is is temporarily insanity, and and in that moment of insanity, you make a very irrational decision, and I, I don't, I just don't think a loving God would condemn your loved one to to eternal hell and fire. And, and if you have a family member who committed suicide and you're worried about that, then send me a message on Messenger on Facebook, and I will personally devote, uh, dedicate mass for them. Thank you. Oh, okay. Next question. Yep. Uh, can demons manifest themselves into apparitions such as children or other adults, um, animals, um, like we see on the television shows? Uh, uh, children, yes. I had a case. It was devastating, devastating. A single mom, uh, she had lost her uh, son, uh, four years old. He ran out in the street and he was playing, his, playing ball and he got hit by a car. She was devastated. She was devastated. And, but then a couple of days later, her family uh, was watching her. She was in the bedroom and she was like holding, she was holding her, her son. It's like, she was, you could, you could see she holding it and she was rocking and she was just talking to him and singing him like his favorite lullaby song. And the, the family contacted me and said, look, we, something's going on here. And so I got there and we did an investigation and we had a, we have a full body apparition of her holding what appears to be her son, but it wasn't, uh, it was a demonic, uh, coming back and reminding her of the invitation that she made when she was 17 years old, when she played with the Ouija board mm -hmm. at her early, at, at her most vulnerable time, that's when the demonic made its, made its move. And that was very difficult to do deal with that was that was hard this is something that i have heard somewhere or read somewhere that if you do see an apparition of a of a human or a child or a, a loved one that's actually demonic it will be disfigured in some way it will not be like the pure person was it will have something that's off about it is that yeah. a myth yeah. is that it, no it's not actually it's in the eyes so you, you there you won't you, there won't there will not be any eyes okay um and and, and, and there's also, there's several things there. There's something just not right about them. It, it, there's a distortion. Uh, many times the face will distort because the demonic can't manifest to an exact perfect replica. I've never seen, I've never seen it in my life. So with the, with the child um, that the mother was holding, thinking it was her child, there were no eyes. Yeah, we had a case like that. They were seeing a doll floating into the room with no eyes. Yeah, that would well, that that'll happens. wake that'll wake you up, won't it? <laughs> <a little> hot, yeah. <laughs> um, okay, let's say a, a house or a home is possessed by a demonic entity, but Infested. not a person. So the, the the location can have a demonic possession and creating no. havoc, or. No. No, okay. no, no, no. Uh, a place cannot be possessed. It doesn't exist. Okay. It doesn't have a place can be infested. infested. So you can, yeah, you can have an infestation, but you know, a place, uh, a, a building cannot be possessed. 
So infestation is that they're living there, they're creating havoc on the people yes. in the house. That's correct. Okay, could they um, cause depression? I mean, oh, with sure. drug use, a lot of these things come, come with that, yeah. Absolutely, I remember it, that, that goes back to uh, once you have an infestation, you have ordinary demonic activity and extraordinary demonic activity. And so if you suffer from drugs and you have a demonic entity present, oh, you can just take one more pill. Just yeah. one more, just one more. I'll just, just take another, take two, take two. You, you don't feel that great. Go ahead and take two. That's ordinary demonic activity. And so now it's starting to see a victim. And then it goes into extraordinary demonic activity where then you have the demonic obsession, then demonic oppression, and then possession. And overdosing, which is what and, and overdosing. Um, a, a lot of us, including myself, have heard growling audibly mm -hmm. and on evps and the growls are so guttural and spine chilling would those normally be thought of as a, a demonic entity hell yes and, and a matter of fact i wish i could uh, play um I, I i was trying to do this the other day let me just do this hold let's see i don't know So I, you probably can't hear that. So let me see if I can, I, I'm trying to figure out a way to where I can uh, play. I know there's a way on Zoom where you can uh, play sound uh, on, on your computer. I, I, I know there's a way to do that, but I am so not, uh, when it comes to this, let me check, let me hold on one second. Because if I can play the sound, because I have a growl that is uh, that is bone chilling, yeah. um, and if I can if I can figure out how to do that, I wish I I, I, I don't know I don't know much you about know it when you hear it that you know it's not human. I mean, it's just oh no no, no question no question yeah there's no there's no question. Matter of fact, hold on one second, uh, bear with me, okay? So let me just because I do want to if I can we'll just do it the old fashioned way. <laughs> Uh, yeah, this Hold is the, the speaker uh, to the camera. Yeah, yeah, this is, <laughs> this is the Kentucky way. By God, I'll tell you what. Let's see. Is there anyone here? Are you friendly? <laughs> that's from the that's from the gates of hell oh boy yeah yeah that's from the gates of hell and and when you when i play it um when i'm doing a presentation and you're actually there and i play it on the the loudspeakers it's like yeah it, it'll 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 wake you up all right here's here's one will a demon communicate with you through itc devices like spirit yes. boxes yes they actually will okay oh sure yeah, any type of device that you use to make communication with the spirit world, you're you're going to, uh, yeah, it absolutely will make, uh, because you don't know what you don't know what you're communicating with, you don't know what spirit it is, you don't know if it's a human spirit, you don't know if it's malevolent or demonic, and so they will. That's that's a portal. Remember, anything you use to communicate with the spirit world, you're opening a portal, and you're using that object in your. So that portal, that object becomes a portal, and so. That's because you're using it for the sole purpose of communicating. Um, if, um, now, we know that human spirits that are malevolent will lie to us. And I mean, I've gotten demon and Satan and those things through ITC and, and Zo, you know, what, Zozo, whatever. Okay. How, is there a way to tell if one's actually demonic or, or just a malevolent human spirit? Is there any kind of test that you would? I, I would I, I, okay. Well, yes, as an exorcist, yes, there are there are tests that I would do. Uh, but if you're a paranormal investigator and you're getting demon coming through, yeah. and you're getting, uh, it's time to go. <laughs> yeah. it, it really seriously, it's time to go because you get, it gets to a point where you're like, well, how 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 much what what else do you want to see? I mean, do, you're you're getting something that could really change your whole entire life for the worse. And so if you stay there, remember, you never act with a doubtful conscience. You may allow an evil to occur. So if you stay there because you want to get more information, that's how the demonic will entice you. Mm -hmm. Because then you, you start, 
because of, uh, what what will happen is it'll it'll be a child. You know, you, you'll hear a child's voice. It's like, oh, that's so cute. And then you're like, well, you start talking and then you start, you hear a growl and you're like, well, that's, that's, that's interesting. Let's see if we can do that again. And what it's doing is it's throwing little tiny bitty bites at you so that it, it just, it's luring you in. It's, it's predator and, and, and prey. It's luring you in to the big reveal. And that's when someone can get really seriously hurt. Yeah. That's not the time to start provoking. It's when they no. say, you know demon um yep. you know we see a lot on like movies and shows where the exorcist is trying to get the name of the demon tell me who you are tell me who you are is that true that once they say their name you have like get the upper hand at that absolutely point? Yep, yep. How, what why and how does that because the demonic doesn't want you to know its name because once you know its name and you know its identity and you know its form you know you know the intent you know uh, the history of the demonic you know the hierarchy of the demonic so when you study demonic there are hierarchies of demons and of, of angels fallen angels and so when you study this it's, it's almost like you have to become a walking encyclopedia of hierarchies of angels and and names and so you become quite familiar with the names that you study them i've studied them since i was nine so i know what hierarchy i know what i'm dealing with when, once i get the name because once you get the name then you have control you know that the intellect and will of the demonic is starting to fade now many times it will lie to you oh. so it, it will say it will say something uh, you know about hitler or it'll say something like this as it did in annalise mckell or it'll say something along those lines um or it, it'll throw out false names and you continue the right and you continue the right and continue it can, over and over and over it's so repetitive and it can go up to eight to ten hours it's so repetitive uh, one one after the other and you just keep breaking it down and breaking it down until you know that the 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 possession is becoming weaker and i won't go into the details of that and then you you you, you force the entity to to give up its name because once it, once it gives up your name, that, that's it. It's game over. It's like it's like um, diagnosing a, a type of cancer. Then you know what treatment to use. Is that yeah, abso absolutely? Absolutely. You know exactly. Thing? You know exactly where to go. You know exactly what to do. You know exactly. Okay, this we need to turn this direction. We need to stay in this direction. We need to use this relic. We need to use it. So you know exactly where to go depending on the hierarchy of the demonic. Um. Not that anyone should be looking this up, but are all the names of the demons in the Bible? I, that's been years since I've read the Bible. I hate to say that, but um, are they all in there? No, I don't. Okay, no. You know, you know where they are. Where they're I all. Do. Okay. Yeah. But they're not in the Bible. No, no. There are ancient texts okay. um, throughout the years. Remember, this is two sixty four. Two, well, actually, two sixty four, where for, the Exorcist was actually first even mentioned, mm -hmm. and so this is a very ancient ritual. There are ancient texts that have clearly stated the names of demonic entities um and the hierarchy of demonic entities and we know all this through exorcisms that have been performed where the okay. demonic entity divulges information because they know the end result so that that's yeah i'll just say are that. there a specific number of demons like are there like not just hypothetically are there 29 and they'll never be like 30. no you know, no there, there there are there are Million, millions. There's one theologian who said that you just simply you you don't know how many there are. Oh, there wow. are there are so there are so many. Just as there are fallen angels, is it possible that fallen angels still occur even today? Mm. Yeah, yeah. You, you because you you could certainly say yeah the fallen angels could certainly occur even now. So. Uh, could could you have demons uh, coming into existence from for well, not coming into existence they've already existed but they fall in angels um, could it happen again today well certainly I mean we'll, we'll know more scary. when we're well yeah yeah <laughs> it's like because it's like they're being born um, but not being born they're just changing teens so to speak uh, it's a pure hatred toward pure hatred to to God okay this is one um, for me. Um, you know, there are thought formed entities like tulpas, how, you know, our minds create, you know, entities and they can be negative and malevolent and can mimic sort of demonic activity in a home, like in an infestation. How would you, if you're going into a case, determine if it is demonic infestation or some kind of thought formed creation 
entity. Does that make sense? Define thought form creation entity. Um, well, you know, like uh, thin man, so to speak. Everybody, mm -hmm. you know, that was that was not real, but then every like collective energy and thought sure. forms, and now people see the thin man. Yep, they manifest itself. They, they manifest. They, yes, they, yep. you know, people manifest entities in their home. Sure. sure. So, but they're not demons. But they may not. But they're not human spirits. Is there a way? How would you say? Okay, this is a demonic infestation, or this is something that we can change with the energy and get rid of it because it's not demonic. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, and and that's that. That's one of the things that we have to also look at when you're talking about the paranormal period, because just as the, when I was talking about that demonic entity or whatever I saw at the gates of hell, I still don't know what that thing was. I, I don't know what its identity is. And that drives me crazy. So when I go into an investigation and there is this, this form, this, I, this, uh, the slender man, if you would, if I walked in and I saw the slender man, uh, I would have to know, I would, it would drive me crazy. I would need to know, I would, I would research because I have such severe OCD when it comes to this stuff. <laughs> yeah. because I, I, I just, it's like, I have to, because if I ever come across it again, I have to know. Sure. So uh, there have been times where I, I have seen things that I can't explain, uh, such as that, that figure that I saw at the gates of hell. Uh, but what I'll do is I'll just begin doing religious uh, provocation. Provocation, true provocation is not beating on your chest. That's not, you're, you're, that's not provoking. If you're beating on the chest and say, come on, I dare you to do something. You're not provoking. All you're doing is inviting. There's a big difference. Provoking is when you begin to start praying. When you pray the St. Ma Michael the Archangel prayer, when you pray the Benedictine prayer, when you pray uh, the Psalms, uh, when you pray Our Father, Hail Mary, when you begin to do the rosary, that's provoking. And you're going to get a reaction if you have a demonic infestation when you start provoking. That's why you have to be careful about that. That's why I always tell people, don't s stop throwing holy water around like it's tap water. You go into, if you go into a place that's known to be demonically infested, stop throwing holy water around because you're going to get a reaction. You're provoking. Yeah. That is provoking. And you will get a reaction and the reaction could be quite violent. So be careful about that stuff. So uh, let me, if we're there to help a family trying to find out the answers and we need to see, is it demonic? Um, do we say the Archangel Michael prayer? I mean, wh how, how do we sure. help? How do we help these people and say, Oh God, no, this is, you know something else or yeah we got to call bishop long this is out our this is out yeah our. It's, it's, say the prayers beforehand say the prayers before you the the protection prayers beforehand and when you go and investigate just understand that if you're walking into a possible demonic infestation and if you say is there anything here can you please make a noise you have just invited it into yeah. your life which we all so just <laughs> yeah so just please that that's that's the reality of being a paranormal investigator that's the dangers that come with this type the, the territory and so you're, you're putting yourself in a really precarious situation so you have to be careful but the minute that things start happening you start praying start using holy water you're going to cause major problems for that family because yeah. the activity is going to become really violent and that's when you don't so if the activity is is clearly leading towards demonic infestation that really is when you say, okay, you know what? We need to take a step back. We, you know, and, and don't immediately tell it, please don't tell the family, please. You have a demon in your home. Oh, it happens all the time because oh. now, now you just scare the living heck out of the family who are truly terrified because they don't know what they're doing. And they look at you as the expert. And now you just told them they have a demon in your home and you say, goodbye. we got to go talk to clergy. Well, yeah. thanks a lot. So I would, I would do it in a way, say, well, what we need to do is if it's clear that there is a demonic infestation case, then you need to do be, be pastoral about it. Just to say, so, okay, we have a lot of information. We've gathered a lot of evidence and it's going to take a long time to go through this. So we're going to take this back. And she, well, what, what do you think it is? Well, we really don't want to say right now because we need to look at the evidence. And then based on that, then we can kind of give you an idea of what we think. And so while you're back in the hotel or, or calling you know, or, or on the way to hotel, you pick up the phone and you call me and say, OK, get your ass over here right now. We got a major problem because this is what's going on and we know what's going on. We need your help now that then 
now you have clergy there because you don't want to show up at the family's house to say, yes, the, uh, we, we got an EVP and we said, are you here? Do you want to hurt the kids? And then you get a class A EVP says, I want to kill them. I mean, <laughs> oh, yeah. great. Thanks a lot. How, how is the mom supposed to react to that? So, yeah, th that's when you call clergy, get them involved and, you know, let them know that there's going to be a resolution uh, because these people are truly legitimately terrified. Yeah, that's why we're there because they got right. gotten to the point where they need help. And that's right. That's and, and, and there's people and there's clergy within the um, within the United States Old Catholic Church. Um, we have a. a I hope he doesn't mind me saying this, but Deacon Tommy Golden, he's been in the, he's been in the paranormal for a very long time. He's studying for the priesthood. And I think he's going to be one day a terrific exorcist. And, and if I get the permission from the presiding archbishop, I will mentor him, personally mentor him in the right, because he has the calling to serve in this ministry. And I think he would be a beautiful, beautiful asset to the church and to the people. He's pastoral. So, yeah, I, I would absolutely. So he he's he's in he's in the waiting he's in in, in the wings right now studying and and so study, pray for him. He's going to he's learning how to be a priest. Uh, he's he, it's tough stuff, and so keep him in your prayers. But uh, eventually he's going to be out there and, and doing doing these rituals as well. So keep him in your thoughts and prayers uh, and all of our seminarians. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Well, one reason I wanted us to do this subject is so many of these young people have glamorized demonic infestation to the point they get so excited when they think. And this is not a joke. This is serious life ruining situation. And I'm, I'm so thankful that you've given us all this information because these young people need to realize this is not a joke. It's, it's serious. I mean, it's a serious business. I, I know people who have done, uh, whose lives have completely, completely been turned upside down because mm -hmm. they got involved in demonic cases. And when I tell you turn upside down, I'm telling you to the bottom of the barrel, the bottom of the barrel, and they still haven't climbed out. Mm -hmm. So th this stuff is, is serious. Uh, it is dangerous. It is real. It is real. It's and true. just, you know, life is hard enough as it is. Let, let, let's not add any more stress to, to life as it is. And, and, and this type of uh, this type of ministry, unless you're, you're really in it for the long haul and you're ready to make the serious look, I have, you see, the back. <laughs> I mean, I, I, you, I, I don't sleep. Mm -hmm. I have, I suffer from insomnia. So I haven't been asleep in over 24 hours. No, oh, geez. Um, and, and so these are the things that I suffer from, from my body. And I will be very lucky, very, very lucky if I see 60, very lucky. Um, but see, I don't fear death. Mm, yeah. So, so I, I don't fear death at all. Um, and, and, and neither should people who there's a lot of people who are afraid of death, but uh, I had a near death experience. Actually, I was clinically dead and um, I saw, uh, uh, tra tra it, tra it literally transformed my life completely trans that's why i i don't there's no fear of death none for wh what i saw I, I can't well it's not the end it's the end of the the human body but we're we're spirit first living a human experience we're not our bodies right. we are our spirits and they will go on to the next adventure so yeah I, well, I'm a medium, so i definitely believe in that so Oh, well, yeah, you definitely would then. Yeah. Well, see my mom, I had an upper GI and um, apparently I had some complications and my mom had passed away in 2014 and I had an upper GI done in 2015. And I remember, I, I know what it's sleeping is. I know what a dream is. I mean, I'm not dumb. I'm, I know what the difference is between sleep and a dream. And I was not sleeping. I was completely awake during this time, I know what's happening. A horrible screeching sound was going on behind the back of me. The doctor started panicking and I'm, he was frightened. He was frightened. And I thought, dude, just relax. Why are you, why are you? Yeah, Cause I, I, there was, I didn't even dawn on me that it was, I was the patient. It, did, it never even dawned on me. It was like, how can I calm him down? He, I, I don't, I hate to see this guy so stressed out. And a light came behind the surgeon and my mom, uh, who was a physician assistant. She was in cardiology. She worked in cardiology. Um, she placed her hand on his shoulders 
Mm. And immediately he calmed down. He just, he went, and he said, okay, we need to do this, 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 this. And the, 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 the noise stopped behind me and my mom, I, I didn't recognize her at first because she was like in her twenties, beautiful yeah. and, and beautiful. And, and I never even saw that, that picture or even that side of her. And then she smiled and she just kind of disappeared. And I spoke to Dr. Jeffrey Long, who's a world leading expert. He's a medical doctor. He is the world leading expert on near death experiences. Mm -hmm. And I think his website is ND nderf.org and he has the world's largest largest expansion of near-death uh, stories it's beautiful and i had him on my show and i interviewed him twice and he said james you realize you died so i can beg your pardon <laughs> and i was like wait, wait. he said you, you you he said i'm telling you as a medical doctor you 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 died because number one, there's no such thing as consciousness with, with the propofol. You don't have consciousness. It doesn't exist. And the fact that you had consciousness, you were completely aware. And that screeching noise was the anesthesiologist machine going off when you flatlined. Because it makes a horrible screeching noise to let them know that, you, that the patient is flatlining. And, and the fact that your mom placed her hand on the surgeon's shoulder, well, she's in cardiology. She's in the medical field. She was guiding him. And that's what the doctor said. And when he said that, I, I, I just couldn't, I mean, I just like, I couldn't talk. Yeah. I, it was like no words, the words wouldn't come out. I just, it was a stun. So, but the, he, it, there's no question, no question that uh, I saw my mom and it was a beautiful, beautiful experience, beautiful experience. Uh, well, um, I have uh, paranormal clergy intake forms. Um, so how do we, if someone who's listening, they've learned something tonight, they're going to do the right thing. They're not going to throw the holy water and salt and sage around if they think, if they're oh. getting growled at and yeah. thrown at them. How can they get help? Well, Rich Valdez, who I love dearly, he's a great friend of mine. I call he's my brother from another mother. Uh, he's been in the paranormal community for a very long time. And I started the paranormal clergy uh, 20 years ago. And, um, and for the, with the sole purpose of eventually bowing out and giving it to the laity. Mm -hmm. And so I, I told uh, Rich, I said, okay, uh, it's gotten to that point. And so I gave, I gave him paranormal clergy, said, here it is. I've worked 20 years of my life. It's yours now. You're the sole owner. So Rich Valdez, you can contact paranormal clergy at yahoo.com. Uh, we do have a licensed um, a mental health therapist uh, that works, that um, does um, psychological evaluations for us. Um, we don't charge for our services. So if you need our services, go through Rich. The, the owner of the paranormal clergy at paranormal clergy at yahoo.com and just say, Hey, look, we need some help. Can you help us? And they'll send a team out and uh, we'll go from there. Perfect. Beautiful. Thank you. Yep. Well, Heather, do you have anything you want to throw in there now? I, I do. Cause I've been rummaging through some of my case files. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, it's like I'm, my brain's exploding <laughs> thinking back now. It's like, Oh gosh, I want to talk to them and ask them this. But, yeah, we'd be here all night if I did that. Yeah, I'll try to make them quick, but I do have um, four quick questions. Um, the first one is that same case where I was flipped. I don't know why we didn't think of it at the time, but this was like one of my early on cases. One of our EVPs that was a true class A EVP was we got the word congruism. And with a quick Google search of it, we couldn't find much on it, but we knew it had to deal with religion. Can you give any insight on that word? Yeah, that 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 sounds like to me that you you have come across a malevolent spirit. Okay. And I'm just gonna leave it at that. I don't want to say demonic because I, I would like to, to be uh, I would like to have more information, but with with the with the word that you've just described, I would be concerned. Okay, because they ended up selling the house, and oh. we couldn't go back for a follow up. <laughs> <Smart>. <laughs> so otherwise i would have gone back for more follow-ups because once we reviewed everything i had more questions than i did yeah. going into it then yeah. going back to the incubus and succubus cases i know you said that they are violent and um but can they still attack and leave no physical evidence well that would not be the purpose that would not that would because okay. that would not that would because they wouldn't want to do anything for the sole purpose of giving you something just for just for sole pleasure now unless there's always an intent behind it 
So it's not, remember, it's not violent in the beginning. Um, but then once you cut it off and you say, that's it, no more, I'm so, I, I, I rebuke you, that's when it becomes very violent. So if there's an incubus and succubus case, and in the beginning, it's not violent at all, and then it just kind of stops, I would be very concerned. I, because there's something, because there, there's an intent behind that. And it's not just to be nice and kind and, and uh, you know, do anything because that's that that's not their whole entire purpose of life is to hurt god and the last thing that they want to do is to help those who are created in god's image mm -hmm. uh, and so there there's there's an intent there's a plan behind if they if they back off for a bit okay yeah well, this case we were thinking that it wasn't but she's had it for five years and there's no physical damage no anything how old is she She's 73. Okay. And now when you sit in the, and she's had incubus, it was an incubus case. She's claiming it is. So it's touching her. Mm -hmm. Yes. Is it, and it's not violent in any way. No. And there's two of them. Oh, yeah. She needs, she needs to knock it off. Uh, has she, has she rebuked it? No, she's done everything. She's been blessed. She's had the house cleansed. She's been cleansed. Yeah, I, I, blessed. I mean, uh, cleansed by sage or like a no, an know. actual blessing. Yeah, okay. yeah. She's had a priest in her home and everything. Yeah, this uh, and it's and it's quite possible that 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 deliverance and we would call that a, a deliverance, removing any type of form of attachment. It could be a lower level demonic that that could have removed the demonic completely. So it really just depends if. Uh, because if you have an attachment, because that wasn't a possession. So that, that's the difference between the incubus and succubus and a demonic entity that possesses. Mm -hmm. So th they're breaking down the intellect and will, and but possession hasn't taken place yet. And so if the, the demonic entity is a lower level demonic and a deliverance is done or performed on the individual to remove any type of attachment, it's quite possible that the expulsion occurred. So in, in that case, in that case, uh, it's very possible that the demonic was defeated. Okay. And then just two general questions is going back to one of Philip's questions is why do you think so many people are so quick to jump to it's a demonic or a demon? Sensationalism, <laughs> you know, and, and also because, because quite honestly that, you know, you, you do that and you put it on YouTube you're going to get the, the, the like buttons yeah, and the viewers. Cool. And people, people do it all the time, all the time. And uh, I, I can't divulge too much information, but I, I was, I, I'm constantly being asked if I want to do a show. And I was just asked just, you know, a couple of weeks ago about a show, but they said, you know, we, we need you to perform an exorcism on someone on camera. <laughs> I said, you you got to be out of your mind. I'm, I'm, don't, don't talk to me ever again. And so but uh, there, there have been a couple of show, you know, opportunities that uh, that it's not like that, that I really like. So, you know, we'll see about how that how that all comes to fruition. But no, this is uh, performing an exorcism on camera is just but that's what they want. It, it's sensationalism. It's scary. People get frightened and they get viewers. Scary cells, scary cells. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately. Well, <laughs> a lot of information yeah <laughs> I, love, I love it and I've, my mind's still racing but we're at two hours um and we haven't even done history of satan breaking generation oh forces devil's toy box lesser key of solomon Everybody i mean coughing. We're going to be here all night. <laughs> the types of prayer self-help how to perform sage how to protect yourself old testament I mean, we have not uh, <laughs> we have been, this is not even a quarter of it so we're going to get you on our schedule <laughs> on a regular basis for next year and we're going to break these down. So you just get your calendar out yeah. together. We'll go through it because we, we do want people to learn the right things. I mean, that's really because they're, they're getting their education from some of the television shows. Not all the shows are bad, but they're for ratings and sensationalism. They're not getting the truth. And these kids are going out and thinking that's what we should be doing. And it's, it's not what we should be doing. So that's why we're doing this. So we really, really, really appreciate you doing this tonight. Yeah. And, and you say you're a medium. So do you do uh, psychic readings then? I only do them for my paranormal work and clients. Yeah. Um, I don't give readings for everybody. I, that's not what I've chosen to use it for. 
yep. and plus it's exhausting. <laughs> well, let, let me say this because it's very important, especially in, in defense for you, because as clergy, I get this all the time is going, uh, going to psychics bad. Is it divi- Is it divination? Is it, uh, well, no, it's not. Actually, if you read uh, Deuteronomy 18 verses uh, 10 through 11, it, it, it talks about le- any, anyone who sacrifices their son or daughter in fire, divination or sorcery or that. But you have to understand, folks, that during Leviticus and Deuteronomy, what was going on at that time was necromancy. And what they were, what, and it was a lot of fraud. And, but they actually believed because they believed there was polytheism. So they, they had many different gods. And so what these people would be th- doing during the time when the scripture was written is they would say, well, I can speak to your loved one. But if I speak to your loved one, then you're going to have to, um, you're going to have to give me more donations, give me more money, or I'll have to, you know, I, I, I'll, I can even raise this individual from the dead and, 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 and force the in, a person not to be an eternal rest. That's necromancy. Yeah. And that was the abomination. Yeah. And that, that's why that part in Deuteronomy was written is because a lot of that fraud was going on because people were threatening saying, well, uh, my God, the God that I, because remember a lot of polytheism was going on. They were saying, well, I will pray to my God that your loved one will never be at rest that I will raise them from eternal rest until you pay me a certain amount of money. That's necromancy. And so that was the abomination, not going to psychic and mediums who are connecting you to a loved one. So I think that's important to know. Yeah. I mean, we, we give healing, uplifting messages. It's, it's yep. never anything negative. I mean, that's not who's coming to us. Right. I do get physical reactions to, evil and negative energy when I go to a location for an investigation I I know going in sometimes I can get it in the driveway I'm, I, to me I start choking like my throat mm. literally closes up so I know what's coming up but yeah no that that's a whole different ball game from mediumship but um I promise you Philip I I, I give you my word if you go yeah, please don't but if you go to the gates of hell i mean oh, no. literally that that three mile road you will it, it is i i can't describe it it, it is it is so oppressive you yeah. i mean that that it's terrible it's a terrible I would, place i would choke to death probably just driving down yeah. the street to it so yeah especially if you're especially if you're an empath uh, yeah <laughs> yeah if you're an empath it, it would really overwhelm you i mean severely overwhelm you no thanks. It's, en- it's enough to deal with sometimes. So I, I'm, not <laughs> going, but I'm not going. I'm not that adventurous. I don't need. I don't need scary in my life to to go do that. I understand so, that. I I, you, yeah, I definitely understand that. All right. Well, Heather, you want to close us out? Sure. <laughs> well, thank you everyone for joining us, and thank you Bishop Long for coming and talking to us. Like Philip said, I'll be in touch, and maybe we can get you on again next year. And, you know, thank you, Philip, for helping me tonight <laughs> in case tech issues arrived, arised again. Um, but real quick before we go, Bishop Long, can you just let them know where to find you? And then I'll make sure that I also comment with your website so they know how to find your class. Yeah, that'd be great. Bishop, yeah, they can just go to bishopjameslong.com uh, and the paranormal course uh, button. They just click that. And you, I, I teach um, demonology, angelology, paranormal studies, and genealogy, all four courses. It's um, 100% online. You learn at your own pace and 100% of that pro- proceeds uh, goes to funding the homeless ministry. And it's actually all four programs are only forty nine ninety nine. So it's, and, and they're intense That's programs. A bargain. Yeah, it's, it's a lot, it's a lot of information. But you're not teaching us how to do an exorcism. No, sir. No, sir. I am not. I will, no, I will Put not. That out there so everyone knows you're not going to learn how to cast out a demon. You will not. You will absolutely not. But you will learn angelology. You'll learn demonology in depth, but you will not be trained to perform an exorcism. That requires years and years of study. Thank you very much. For, everybody got that, right? <laughs> and I'll share the website again tomorrow or tonight. Um, but Philip, do you want to let people know where to find you? Uh, Facebook. I mean, I live on Facebook. So yeah, Philip Wyatt. I'm with um, the Mystery Center for Advanced Paranormal Phenomenon. You can you know, our page, our website, um, I'm around. I'm not hard to find. <laughs> but I don't do readings for everybody. So don't be asking me to contact grandma for you. <laughs> if she just happens to show up, I'll let you know. But I'm not, yeah. I did and, that this evening, though. I had to contact somebody because they're. I didn't know it was their grandfather. But he showed up. And I said, I think your grandfather's here. I'll, I'll do that. Wow. 
And, and then I'm also the founder of Exploration Paranormal. You can find us on Facebook as well as Googling us, or you can find my Facebook page and my blog, which is at Dr. Heather Lee, which is D-R and then Heather Lee and it's L-E-I-G-H. Or you can also find me on the Ghost Education 101 page along with Philip and all of our other educators. We, this is our last broadcast for the year. We will be returning January 6th and we're gonna do a five ser episode series um, where you get to meet all the educators and get to know us more on a personal level and our qualifications and what we do. So again, thank you everyone for joining us. I will post the information tomorrow and also we will have the replay up tomorrow, if not tonight, um, depending on how soon we get it, but we will get that all out to you guys. So thank you for joining us and you guys have a great night. Bye-bye.